How many people here have watched the movie, or maybe I should rephrase the question, to how many times have you seen this movie, Forrest Gump? <laughs> Forrest Gump is one of my favorite movies of all time. I, I must have seen it seven times in the theater, another 30 times outside of that. But I love how the, the whole motif of Forrest Gump is how a simple man accomplishes far more than many of the intellectual and cultural snobs we have in this room. How this man, that simple-minded, accomplishes amazing things in life, where going to the White House is again and not once, where accomplishing and, and investing in Apple computer, which is a smart thing, you know, it's, he becomes successful and famous, but all because he does what he knows. I love this scene, and my favorite scene in the movie Forrest Gump is when Forrest joins the army. Remember when he meets Bubba? I love that movie. I love that scene. But I love that scene when they go to boot camp, and the drill sergeant asks Forrest, Forrest, why are you here? And he screams. Tom Hanks says, whatever you tell me to do, what? To do, drill sergeant. And then the drill sergeant, is, he heard this answer, and this is the most impressive answer he ever heard in history. And he says, you are a genius, Gump. Why are you so smart? You must have an IQ of 147, Gump. If you keep doing this, you're going to be a general, Gump. He goes, yes, General Sergeant. And the, the, the truth is, Gump experiences exponential success in the Army when most people have a hard time going through boot camp. Now, the same truth would apply to faith. What if, tell, so, tell someone right now, what if, if I obeyed and did what God told me to do, rather than complaining or having a poor attitude about it, when he said to do it, and, and exactly what he told you to do, and you actually did it rather than complain about it, I wonder what type of exponential change we would experience first internally and then externally we would advance our life. But a lot of people go, well, to do what God says, when he says it, and what he says to do is hard. Because I feel like if I do what he says, I end up losing. All right? This misconception and deceptive idea, this notion that obedience is a loss. Tell someone, I think obedience is a loss. Yeah, you go, well, Pastor Sam, if I obey God and I obey him and I don't want to, then I lose out on what I really want. I think obedience is a loss. To me, it doesn't compute that way. Today, I want to kind of help us see that this is a lie. The Bible says if you what? Fully obey my what? Commands. And you what? If you follow all and follow my commandments carefully, I will what? Lift you what? High above the nation. Here is the notion a lot of us feel and this is a feeling, of course. A lot of us feel that if we obey, we lose. But the Bible clearly teaches obedience is rewarded. Amen? Clearly the Bible teaches obedience is rewarded, but I think a lot of us have two problems in the way we look at obedience. We have two fundamental problems of how we see obeying God fully, carefully, and holistically. We go first, we have a problem with the perception of it. Right, what's the first perception? What's the problem? Well, you fear, if you do it, you feel the, before you even think about what it is, you fear the result. What if? How many people ever tell themselves that? When God tells you to do something and you go, well, what if it doesn't work out? Right, the condition. What if I obey and I end up losing? No one wants to, what, lose? Be in a lose-lose situation. I obey God, I get nothing, and I lose what I could have had. So the perception of it automatically makes you struggle with it, right? 
Because you go, well, what, what, what is the result going to be if I obey? That's the perception of it. Second, it's the incentive. How do I know if I obey? I'm going to get something in return. I don't know. I can't see it. It's not tangible for me. Well, today I want to help us see the biblical perspective, what the Bible teaches about obedience. And maybe it can help us really debunk some of these feelings and fears that we have and see very clearly that obedience is immensely rewarding internally and externally. All right, so let's go to this text and, and talk about this. What does obedience, what does the Bible teach about obedience? All right, so first, we look at this passage, verse 1. Now, I want you to read the first word with me. What does it say? If you what? Now, what does it say? It doesn't say obey. It says what? Fully. Tell someone fully. So therefore, obedience is not obedience unless it's fully followed through. Not playing both sides of the fence. Fully. So first of all, the Bible teaches that obedience is fully obeying the Lord or Master, right? Fully obeying the Lord and, and what? And what? What's the second word? And what? Carefully. Meaning you can't do it like, okay, I'm going to go through the motions and do the action of obedience. You have to actually think through it too. Why you're doing it. Carefully. And what? What, what else does it say if you look down? And what? Verse 14, it says what? Do not turn aside from what? Any of the commands I give you today, the, the right or to the left. So you have to follow straight through it. Following, and it says what? Following which gods? Other gods. So then why is the language grammatically here so careful and precise in the way obedience is? That's because most of the time, our hearts are divided. Our hearts are divided. You go, oh, I want to follow God. No, you don't. You want what you want. Jesus puts it this way, right? You can't have what? Two masters. Either you're going to love the one and hate the other. The Bible talks about this very clearly. If you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. And here's the thing. A lot of people that even that are nominal, atheistic, agnostic, they go, well, I don't think God is out there. And you guys go, well, you know that for sure? Yeah, I know that for sure. How do you know that for sure? I have science, really. I, I tell this to every single person that I've met that are PhDs, that are bankers, that are doctors, that are just successful people. They go, well, I, I, follow the, I follow the logic. I follow the money. I go, listen, if you actually, the Bible says, seek him with your whole heart, meaning you don't need to believe that this is true. You give your heart to it. You, you search with your whole heart, the Bible says. And you, he says, then you shall find me. Because finding God is a privilege. It's not like God needs worshipers. Oh, I need worshipers today. I want people to worship me. God knows he's awesome. It's just if you seek me with your heart. So if you're, if you're nominal today, if you're, if you're a seeker today, a lot of times, a lot of seekers don't give it all. They, all they got. They don't search with all. It's just, oh, whatever. If you really want to find God, the Bible says you have to seek him with your whole heart. Now for followers, you got to follow with your whole heart. You can't leave anything. And here's my conflict all the time, especially last night at a rehearsal dinner for the wedding. And you know how in rehearsal dinners, they give you a, a fixed menu. You have limited choices from what you can select. And here's my conflict. The appetizer. Three choices. Eggplant. Nah. Lord, why'd you make eggplant? And, no, I don't want eggplant. And there are a couple of other ones. I go, okay, and people are like, over there, someone's telling me, Gustavo's like, you should get the eggplant, excellent. I'm like, okay, I'm sold. Then the entree. See, and here's my problem with the entree, it's always the most delicate decision that you make. 
you're conflicted, right? There's the chicken parm. There's the salmon. There's the, you know, pasta with clam sauce. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get the bread. I'm going to get the chicken parm. My wife said, you shouldn't get the chicken parm. I'm like, I'm going to get the chicken parm. She goes, you should get the salmon. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to get the chicken parm. I think I'll be good. I think that'll be hearty. Because I was pretty hungry. So I ordered the chicken parm, and then my friend gets the salmon. And the whole night, the whole night, I hate my chicken parm. I hate it. I see the salmon. The salmon looks so good. I'm like, I'm like, Dave, give me some of your salmon. Oh, yeah, here, here we go. And I'm just like, and I'm just, my wife's like, I told you you should have got the salmon. <laughs> I'm just like, be quiet. And, I, and I'm just, the whole night, I'm regretting this decision. I'm regretting. I'm conflicted. I'm like, why did I get the chicken parm? Why, 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 why did this happen to me? And here's the problem with the idea of obedience. A lot of Christians experience, and a lot of seekers experience. Seekers, here, here it is. The problem with obedience is not the fact that you, you do something. Because that's just the action. Why you do something no one can see. Because really, it's the motivation of why you do something. The heart behind it. And why it's so complicated and why it's so elusive to really grasp is because the incentive is invisible. Why you choose something. It's about desire. How many people here know what you really want? I want a chicken parm. Until what? The salmon came out. Now, this applies to everything in life. You cannot serve two masters. And the problem is we're very, very precarious in our desire. I, I, I think I want, no, I don't want that. I think I want this. And now th they ask me, what, what do you want for dessert? I was like, get away from me. <laughs> right? And here it is. Desire is the most elusive part about humanity. You don't know what you really want. And here what the text is asserting is, if you're going to really follow after God, if you're going to really seek God, do it with everything. And then, empirically, study the result. Don't do it half-hearted. Don't do it like you're doing the motion for whatever reasons. Because you want to impress people. Because you want to have a perception of being spiritual. Because this is something that you grew up with. Don't do it just because. You need to do it externally. What's the most important part of this passage is what? It's the heart of it. It's the motivation behind it. It's the reasoning behind it. It's all carefully undivided. And a lot of people I, I speak to go, well, you know, I, I tried it. I tried the gospel. It doesn't work. Really? Have you gave it all? Have you really given it all? Without restraint, given this passage, you're all. So, what does the Bible teach about obedience? Well, first lesson we learn from Deuteronomy 20 is what? Real obedience is what? Choosing to follow one master fully and not partially. And a lot of times is we choose God because we think we want God, and then we go outside and we don't want God. We want that. I don't know what that is to you. The question is, what is that? Ask someone, what is that? What is your that? Right? And, and this is the problem with adultery, and this is the problem with cheating, right? You're with, you're with your guy, and another guy comes. I think I want that guy. Or the girl, you're with this girl, she was the girl of your dreams. And then another girl comes, I think I want salmon. <laughs> I think I want that girl. But I, th I thought you wanted this girl. I thought you sl enslaved for this girl for four years. Oh, I don't like chicken parm. I realize I don't like. And you see, so the precarious situation of desire has to be submitted here. You see, you're not... You're not committing to the action. You're committing your what? Desire, the volition. And once the volition is set, that's when the real idea of finding God is true because you have to actually do it the right way. It's just the way what it is. Right? You can continue to push when it's pull. You're never going to open the door. So my 
advice to you today from this text is this. If you're a Christian, if you're a Christian and you believe in Jesus and Jesus worked in your life and you found him, don't be like, well, it's not working. Where are you, God? I'm not... I am not, I'm not working for the UN. I'm not set high above the nation. I am nobody. What's going on? Are you doing it with everything? My suspicion is, no, you're not. Your desire is divided. You have two masters. And you're not following one wholeheartedly. So, let me ask you this question as we move on today. To the next part of the text. Is your heart divided? Is your heart divided? I pray the Spirit of God show you where, why, and come back to Him and give it everything you got. That's when the text works. Okay, so let's move down here. Now, here is the issue of obedience. And so some people would say, okay, Pastor Sam, I want blessing. How many people here like blessing? Ask someone, do you like blessing? Ask them if you want to be blessed. You want to be blessed by God. You want God to bless your life. You go, you read this passage, you came today, and Judy was reading the text, and you're like, I came the right day. <laughs> He's going to bless me in the country, bless me in the city. He's going to bless my bank account. This is the prosperity message that I like. Here, here's the issue here. Let me just tell you, the Bible tells it very clearly that you cannot, God will not be mocked. Let me tell you, people, God is not stupid. Like, we can manipulate God. Oh, God, I'm look, look. God looks at the heart. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trick God. I got you. I mean, this is the stupid, it's called stupid Christianity. For people that actually believe that they, they think that they could deceive God, I mean, how did you become a Christian? You can't deceive God. God knows the motive. The inner part of every perception, every thought, you can't manipulate God. Paul says in Galatians 2, very clearly, God will not be mocked. You will reap what you sow. So a lot of people go, well, you know what? I'm going to follow God so that I could be blessed. And here's the issue. Here's the problem with this. The, the text says here, what's the first word? What's the first word? Read it to me in verse 1. Last time I checked, if is a conditional statement. Read the fine print. If is a conditional statement. If you fully, if you carefully, if you give all, and you could only give all, and you can only follow carefully, and you can only give what? Fully? If you have the right motivation. God will not be mocked. Like, for example, in places in Africa, let me tell you right now, I, sad to say, but now Africa has the largest church in the world. No longer Korea. Boo. Korea has the seven largest church in the world. Now Africa, Nigeria, and Uganda, they have like two million people. Can you imagine a service with two million? They have to, they have to get buses to drop you off at a seat. But let me, what, let me tell you what's popular in Africa. Let me tell you why so many people... And I'm sure there are genuine conversions, but let me tell you about the, the gospel that's famous in Africa. It's called the BMW gospel. So what people preach is, if you, and this is how they do it, if you believe in Jesus, Jesus will give you a BMW. If you believe in Jesus, Jesus will give you a BMW with gold in it. How many people, if you're poor, if you're hungry, and someone tells you, if you believe in Jesus, Jesus is going to what? Bless you and give you a BMW with gold. And how many people are not going to sign up for that? The incentive is simple. I believe in Jesus. What does that even mean? I don't care. Just give me the gold and give me the BMW. That's the prosperity gospel. But let me just tell you right now, it's not very different from the way people understand the gospel in metropolitan context. If I believe in God, God will give me, and you fill in the blank. Right? And here's the problem. When, when God talks about the commandments, he's talking about what? The Ten Commandments. What's commandment number one? Do not have any idols. 
You just broke that because what you want is success. You want the idols of success, the altar of success. Well, if I do this, then God's going to give me success. You just broke the commandment. God's not more important. What's, what's the most important thing to you? Success, not God. Therefore, you haven't fully given your life to God. Second, thou shalt not have no other gods before me. Well, God is last priority to you, not first. Why? Because you want success. You want what you're trying to get. So here is really the differentiation of the desire of what you're trying to get, right? Because if you want success or prosperity, why do you want it? Ask someone right now in your mind, tell someone, why do you want prosperity? Ask them that. Why do you want it? Did you think about why? Well, you want, you, a lot of people do this in the, in the Oscars. Christians come up. First of all, I would like to thank God. What? I would like to thank God for the talents that he's given me. You want prosperity for your own glory. A lot of people that are blessed for some reason forget God. Oh, I did this on my own. A lot of times people want whatever they want so they can look good for your own glory. This passage is talking about you following after God's plan. Oh, yeah, that part. God's purpose. You wanting to be used by God, not using God for what you want. Here's the difference. When you're used by God for his purpose, you bring what? Him? Say it. Glory. When you use God for your purpose, what? Who gets the glory? You get it. So God's going to really bless you? No. A lot of people go, well, why is the gospel not working? Well, because it doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. Here it is. Let me show you how incentive is invisible, how the motivation is invisible. My wife goes to me, Sam, what are you going to do tonight? That's a dangerous question. When you come from work, you're home, it's a Friday night, what are you doing tonight? Because that means let's do something. And of course, I love my wife. I, everybody knows I love my wife. Come on, say amen. Come on up. I, I, but I can love my wife after I watch the basketball game. <laughs> but here it is. Here it is. I can go, honey, I don't like basketball. I don't want to watch the game. It's not like I DVR'd it. <laughs> I will do what you want to do. And you know what? It could look like I'm being a good husband, good hubby. But you can't see my heart, right? And this is where people are passive-aggressive with God and passive-aggressive with people. Just people, listen to me. Just because people do you a favor, don't you think that they're li they like it? Can you help me move? Sure. But they, um, just be careful. When you move, put your toothbrush in different places. <laughs> yeah, I'll help you move. Oh, my God, I can't believe you, got, you took my Saturday away. I hate you. Here, take it. Rub it in the toilet. Rub it in the toilet. And you go, and, you, and then you leave. You go, I'll help you anytime. Ask me again. You cannot see. The, the, the heart is invisible. So for the seeker, they could be actually be looking like, well, you know, I'm sort of interested. I want to talk about God, but are you really? Because if you, let me just put it this way. God is either all or nothing. It's, it's all. Give it all you got. And if you come with the other end and you gave it all and you got nothing, then it's okay. But I never seen first anyone that sought out God that was an atheist, agnostic, or whatever that did not meet God when they sought him with all their heart. I found every single time God showed up in their life. And they said, oh, my gosh. That's how it sounds. Oh, with a high pitch. Oh, my God. Because you know when it's high pitch, it's a surprise. And I never met someone that believed in God that gave it all and followed God fully, carefully, and gave it all that God did not transform utterly out of their mind and brought them to places they could never even imagine. The problem is half-heartedness. The problem is desire. The desire needs to be transformed. The gospel works. 
It's proven empirically for 4,000 years. It's just the way it is. The question is, are we giving it all as a seeker or as a believer? So, what does the Bible teach about obedience? Well, lastly, we learn from this passage. What? Read it with me. The reward is what? Upon what? Based on your heart's motive, because God will not be mocked. God will not be mocked, folks. So, let me ask you a question then. Do you love the giver, or are you obsessed with the gift? Because that question will determine where you really are with God. So where are you? And it will determine if you really have power, if God's power will really come. And here is what I want everyone to stand, and we're going to pray. Stand. You know, are you searching for the giver, or are you? simply in love with the gift. Because the giver is who you need to know. Father, today, a lot of us see obedience as a loss. Obedience is a loss if we're doing it blindly. Obedience is a loss if we're doing it to use God. It doesn't work that way. But if, catch this, if, the text says, if you want to fully be used by God, if you want to carefully be used by God, if you want to be fully be used by for His purpose and for His glory, then obedience releases blessings you cannot imagine. First, for the character of the person, because the person then becomes deflated in their ego and glory and is filled with joy because they're part of something so much larger than who they are and what they can accomplish on their own. And second, it brings an ultimate clarity of the transcending purpose of why they put on this earth as God lifts you up to represent him well. So will you lift your hands with me to the Lord, and I'm going to ask you to spend some time with God with this issue. Is your heart divided? Either you're going to love one master or hate the other. Or there can't be both ways. And the truth is, if you're struggling in your faith, and you're a Christian, what you're really struggling with is God being God. I, well, I don't, basically, I don't want to follow you, God, because I want to follow me. I mean, that's why you have the same conversation with God all the time. God says, give this up. You go, no. So who's God in your life? You are. And that's why there is no change. That's why there's no progression. And you go, well, the gospel doesn't work yet. It doesn't work because... It doesn't work that way. If you're a seeker today, yes, there's the intellectual components of, of the gospel and Christianity, and there's reasonable approaches to apologetics of God. But through, throughout all history, God has revealed himself to people that sought him out and saw and took a chance to see if he's really there. And searched honestly. And I admonish you and invite you to search for him fully. So will you lift your hands to God with me today? And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit right now. Spirit of God, will you come in this room?
I pray no one would feel good today. I pray that we would feel the conviction of God. And through the pain of whatever we're going through, we would experience the joy of being used to bring you glory by worshiping you. So Spirit of God, come and convict us in our dividedness and convict us in our motive of following you. Sing it out with this. Moan me. Moan me and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Father, we come before you. We're going to declare that you are the potter. Will you lift your hands for me as we sing this verse? Let's make it our prayer. And will you right now tell the Lord, Lord, I want to be reminded that you are the potter and I am the clay. And I know, God, that I resist the finger, the hands that try to form me, to chisel me into the creation and the purpose you have for my life. And I know I resist that, God. But today, today, I want to declare that you are the potter of my life and I want to surrender to your craftsmanship of my life, of my experiences, of my journey. Because I trust by faith you are making me into a person that can bring you glory. You are the potter. I am the clay. I am the clay. Let's make this our prayer. Mold me. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. This is what I pray. You are the potter. You are the potter. I am. Mold me and make me, Lord. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. This is what I pray. Father, the desire to follow you cannot be manipulated it cannot be reinforced by people. It is something we must choose to do on our own. No one could help us fully obey. 
No one can help us fully and carefully and give all to God except us. It is a choice we have to make. The question is, is it worth it to follow through? The truth is, the Bible makes it very clear, you will only find him when you seek him with your whole heart. Today I pray, Father, for the motivation to change. And if I'm going to do this, I'm going to give it all. And then have something to complain about. But I did it. Well, if you do it, I know God's going to show up. Because God is true to his word. The Bible says, heaven and earth will fade away, but his words will remain. The word of God is infallible and true. If you do what it says, it releases what it says. And I pray today, God, that we will take you on that invitation and that you begin to work in our lives and we would begin to fully and holistically and carefully follow you. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's give God a clap offering. Give him worship. God bless you. We'll see you soon. Uh, today we just have a couple of quick announcements for everybody, starting out with uh, tithes and offering. You know, we want to keep God at the center of everything in our lives, and that does include our finances. So we just ask all of our members here at 180 Church to remember to tithe faithfully to God because he has blessed us so abundantly. You can tithe either on-site. There are envelopes at the info booth when you uh, leave service today. Or you could tithe online uh, at 180church.tv through PayPal. Or you can, uh, if you have Chase... Quick Pay, you can uh, go to Chase Quick Pay's uh, website uh, and uh, make an offering through offering at 180church.tv. Uh, next, we have uh, our prayer and request line, 5397 Prayer. As Pastor Lydia said, you know, we had another person come to Christ this week, so that's something that, you know, a lot of us are thankful for. Yeah. And, um, Anytime we have praises or requests for God, you know, we can send those in, we can text them, or we can uh, send an email to the, uh, to the website there. And, you know, we pray for these things because God is alive, God is really moving, and again, he showed it this week by bringing another person home to his house. So uh, remember, you know, just text your, uh, your requests in and text your uh, praises in. Uh, next, we have small groups. We have small groups that meet uh, here in Manhattan as well as in Staten Island all throughout the week. We have them for all different demographics, whether you're from high school all the way up to working professionals and beyond that. Uh, if you're not in a small group, it's where we talk about the message. It's where we really get uh, more in tune with what God is saying in our lives. And uh, if you want to get plugged into one, you can just talk to Andrew Park. He's right there on the screen there. And you can uh, talk with him. He'll get you plugged in. And if you have any questions about 180 Church, you know, who we are, what we stand for, those sort of things, you can also see him. He'll give you all the answers that you need. Uh, lastly, um, we send out a, uh, an email every week with the uh, sermon, you know, to recap what Pastor Sam said. And at the uh, bottom of the email, there's a uh, link where you can send it to a friend of yours that you want to invite along uh, in the journey in Christ. So you can just go to the bottom of the email, click on it right there, and send it and uh, bring them along the journey. Uh, that's all of our announcements today.